Welcome to Revamped, the number one amputee podcast hosted by an amputee and brought to you by De La Torre Orthotics and Prosthetics in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm Brian Mosier, the social media advisor for De La Torre, and I also happen to be a left below me amputee. Let's get into today's episode. How's it going, everyone? My guest today is a motivational speaker, a marine technician in the Royal Australian Navy, and a right above knee amputee, Mark Daniels. Mark, welcome to Revamped. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So I know that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you're a right above knee amputee. When did your limb loss story begin? Yeah, so it was the 17th of December, 2015. Um, I had a distracted driver turn across my lane when I was riding my motorbike home. And yeah, we had just got back from deployment three days before. So you think if anything that's going to happen, it would happen on deployment. But yeah, I started off as a below knee and then that didn't really work. So then I've gone to a right through knee amputee. And that happened 3rd of March this year. Oh, wow. Okay. You, uh, what's your recovery been like? Because I, I saw some pictures, what, from this past weekend, uh, you were out doing some pretty extreme things. Or so how's your, what's your recovery process been like for you? Um, pretty quick. I don't really set limitations on myself, so I bounce back pretty quick. Um, after the original accident in um, 2015, now that took a while um, because I had a broken neck, 11 ribs, punctured lung, ruptured kidney, my heart was crazed. Broken right hand, slipped femoral artery, four fractures to my femur. I've got a rod from my knee to my hip, four pins in the side. Uh, I was in a coma for 10 days, 65 units of blood, and then went into cardiac arrest three times. So it was a lot to get through. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know, like, in the States, you guys all get crutches, but over here we get wheelchairs instead. Yeah. So I was into a wheelchair for quite some time. Yeah. I was was still training and stuff at the gym, so. Oh, Wow. I, um, yeah, I was in a wheelchair, you know, after, after my amputation. So I know some people use crutches. I wasn't able to do that. I was just too sick and too weak, but how in the world, I mean, it's a miracle. You survived all of those things that happened. Oh yeah. Everyone you ask, all the medical professionals, everyone's like, there's no way you should be alive. So I believe I'm here for a bigger purpose. So we'll see what that is. Yeah, absolutely. So when did you get your first prosthesis? Um, it was April, uh, 2016. And that was my first baloney prosthesis made at Fiona Stanley hospital in Perth. And then from there, and you, you, be, you became an above knee amputee earlier this year. When did you get, uh, your new prosthesis with the knee and all of that? Um, so it was, I think it only took me three weeks to be able to get in the prosthesis. Um, and I ran a half marathon, I think five weeks after my amputation. That's incredible. Wow. I mix it up between like the wheelchair and my leg. Okay. But yeah, I'm pretty stupid in some ways, but (laughs) other ways it pays off. (laughs) Sure. So, you know, a lot of people have told me who have been below knees and then they become above knee that above knee is far more difficult. Would you agree with that? Oh, I would. Um, If you can keep your above knee, I say your below knee, keep it. Um, being through knee is definitely better than being above knee because I can load both through my femur where a lot of people get that discomfort with the soffit go right up to like the groin area where mine sits probably about 10 centimeters below my groin. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, as a through knee, I can take a lot more impact through my stump. Okay. Um, so that pays off, but as a below knee, like you've got your knee function, you're a lot more stable. It's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, and that's the main thing is trying to being able to afford prosthetics legs that are able to actually let you do what you're capable of. And that leads me right into one of the things that I I wanted to ask you, because, you know, uh, things are vastly different here in the States. What is insurance coverage like for prosthetics in Australia? Okay. Um, so it varies state to state. Um, I know Victoria where I am at the moment is a lot better, but they have the TAC, and so how it works is we pay our registration like, to drive on the roads every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then included in that registration is a third-party insurance. Mm-hmm. Now, that third-party insurance will cover all your bills and like, it will get you the basics. Um, they're not going to be funding X3s. Like, the best I've pretty much heard anyone get is a sea leg. Okay. But like with my job requirements being in the Navy, I need the X3. Okay. So 
I'm really pushing for an X3, which is a hundred and sixty thousand dollar leg. Right, right. Wow. Um, so yeah, like they they do cover stuff, but it's not enough. But then I see like the American system where you guys don't have that coverage. Right, it's no. extremely messed up. But yeah, we 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 have a very messed up insurance system here, and it. I mean, you you know. I, I don't like to say fortunately, but I mean, you know, uh, one one thing that is done right, you know, is that our our veterans and those who serve are very well taken care of, um, especially those that want to go back and, and be on active duty. Um, but just, you know, for the average person, you know, I'm just a civilian and for the average person, it can be very difficult. I'm one of the, the lucky ones. I don't know if I like that word, but uh, I'm very fortunate. To have, to <laughs> lucky have when you get one word. doesn't really exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I always say luck is for losers, but, um, um, but I'm very fortunate to, be, you know, to have great insurance because not everyone does. So uh, my leg, and I'm below knee, and my leg cost around thirty five grand, and I didn't have to pay a single dime because of my insurance um, that I have. And so I was just kind of curious how that works over there, and that's uh, – that's very interesting. It sounds like it's just maybe insurance isn't really great anywhere. Um, it gets you the basics, but they, it's all about wants and needs. So okay. like being able to run as a 24 year old insurance in their words, it, that is a want, not a need. Okay. Uh, wow. Being able to ride a bike is a want, not a need. Now my response to that was, do you have to justify why you go for a bike ride with your kids or while you go for a run with your dog after work? And they came back that we're not, basing this on a personal level it's based on a case-by-case basis wow so yeah it's it's a bit hard um but there's grants like i've been going through a few companies uh there's other disabled organizations that will help out and i've just got a ten thousand dollar grant towards my running leg oh nice um so yeah now i've actually raised the funds for the running leg i'm just waiting on a bit more like size to drop out of my stump before i make a new one okay what what has been be great. what what's been some of some of the biggest challenges that you have faced uh, since you first became an amputee? Well, there's there's different. It's the you've got the physical challenges, and right. for me, that's what I thrive on. Um, like I get off on being able to put myself in pain. Okay, because it's my like, it's my choice. Right, being able to put myself through obstacle course races, like marathons, everything else, like the gym, the weightlifting I do, like that's all about me. Um, it's also being able to inspire other people. Like, yeah, that's a side effect of what I do. But like, for me, it's an internal battle. It's trying to prove to people that a disability doesn't stop you and it's not going to slow you down. And it really is all in your head. But wow. then the, the other side of things is the mental thing. And everyone can see your physical disability and they go, oh, yeah, like, well, he's walking now, so he's better. But like going through the PTSD and the stuff that I really struggled with was, especially as a young male, was talking about it actually trying to explain to people um i think even now pretty much yeah just under two years on i'm still struggling with it and it's not so much that like i'm not coping i am but i can't accept it for me it's all been about trying to resist the fact that i am an amputee and that i can still do everything an able-bodied person can well i haven't actually actually gone through the process where i've accepted what has happened to me and I think because the court case and everything gets dragged out so long and like you're constantly going through rehab and I found these distractions that keep me really busy, but it wasn't until like last week when this new girl that I'm seeing, like she mentioned it, she's like, have you actually considered the fact that you haven't accepted that you've got one leg? Which I know I've got one leg, but whether I've accepted it or not is a whole different thing. You know, and I can definitely relate to that. That's that's a very I've never heard it put quite like that. But that's a that's a very interesting thing to say to someone. Um, whether or not you know we have actually you know we have the knowledge, but have we accepted it? That's very interesting. She's the first person that's ever said that to me. Wow. And uh, I wasn't angry. I wasn't upset. Like I was actually like, you know what you're the f-? like, and I've internally I know it myself. Right. I've always known that, and I've always known at some point I'm going to have to like deal with it but I've never had anyone call me on it before. So for her to actually be able to call it and we've only been like seeing each other for a month. Wow. So it was, it was a big thing, but I'm glad you did. Yeah, absolutely. So you said that, you know, that you thrive on the physical challenges. What are some of the things, I mean, I know that you've, you've been, you're in the Navy and I know that you're extremely physically active and you're in the gym and uh, you're doing things. What are some of the activities that, that now that you enjoy being involved in? All right, so I do powerlifting. That was pretty much the first thing I got back into, okay. uh, learning how to adapt and like, pistol squat and deadlift on one leg. 
that was certainly a big challenge. But then I realized I was really good at it. So I kind of just threw in myself at it. And the days mm-hmm. when I was having the bad days, they were the days when I went to the gym for three hours and just worked through all my issues. Hmm. Um, so that's been the one thing. But then now my next goal is the Paralympics. And for powerlifting, it's only bench press. And I'm only benching 120 kilos, which I think is 240 pounds. Okay. Uh, going to convert it for American listeners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, the other guys are, have, like, they've got 100 pounds on me that they're benching. And because it's based on weight category, they're benching a hell of a lot more because these guys are paras and all they do is train like chest. Wow. Um, so now I'm looking at training, uh, changing over to triathlon. Uh, I've got a few good mentors in that side of things. Uh, I'm swimming, um, riding every day. I just need to be able to run, which I'm waiting on the legs for. Uh, other than that, I do obstacle course racing. Okay. Um, so my main goal now is to try and like do Operation Enduring Warrior. Okay. Uh, which is the um, American vets that run like Spartan Race and all the obstacles. I'm now trying to build the same thing in Australia and really like grow the adaptive OCR scene over here. Um, I do a lot of like ninja training as well, um, for some activities that are coming up in the near future that I can't mention. Okay. Um, <laughs> you'll see it on my Facebook soon enough. Yeah, um, yeah. and then, um, I, um, so what else we got going? I snowboard, I wakeboard. Um, just pretty, I pretty much do everything. Like if someone says, do you want to do this? I say yes. And then I think about it later on. And say, How am I actually going to do this? So I, I saw on, uh, Facebook, tell me about this this video of you. Uh, the one you posted where it says, you know, living life on the edge is always more fun. How, oh, yes. <laughs> how, how high up are you on, on the edge of that rock face? Um, probably wouldn't have been a good time if it came off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, went for a hike with Rach, the girl I was telling you about. And, yeah, we went for a hike on the weekend. And yeah, it was really good. Like it was really challenging, and I used crutches just because of some of the drains that like rocky and like it limits falls a bit. But yeah, no, it's definitely worth it when you get to the top and you can actually just like take a step back and realize how small you are compared to nature. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I was just I saw that and I was like, wow. And then uh, I know there's a, the uh, there was another picture I saw where it looks like you're actually hanging on. Uh, no, I, I was, I was definitely <laughs> hanging on for my life in that picture. <laughs> I was trying to get her to take the photo quicker cause it was slipping. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's uh, I, that's, you know, that's awesome that you could do all that and that you stay active because I've, I've always been one that said, you know, for me as an amputee being active, just staying active and the things I enjoy has really helped me. Um, it does. And like, I think as you know, with the go through every day, oh, sorry, I'm not meant to swear on you. No, uh, no, you're stuff- fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the stuff we go through every day, um, it's hard. And some days, like even now, like you wake up, you look down, see your legs gone, see your scars, the empty bed next to you. And you think, who would ever want to be with me? Or like, what's the point in being here? Right. But it's these activities and it's the sport, it's the communities you meet, like doing activities like this. That's what work makes it worthwhile for me. It's being able to really like get people to question, the, like, able-bodied people, like the amount of people, oh, I could never do that. I could never do this. And if I can show them that, look, I don't put them down, but I go, hey, look, I've got my leg, but I'm still doing it. And then generally you find the question or own excuses. What kind of resources are available for amputees in Australia? Uh, we've got a few really good um, organizations. There's Limbs for Life, um, the Spinal Limb Foundation. Um, then you've got like your disability sport, like uh, Rebound WA really helped me. And like that was definitely a good thing. Okay. Because I was terrible at playing uh, basketball with two legs. But when they suggested that I go play basketball like in a wheelchair, I'm like, okay, this is weird. But it was more about like the community feel and the people on the court with you. These people, like, we've all gone through different stuff, but at the same time, we've all gone through the same stuff. We all know what it's like to feel like it's being disabled and you don't fit into society. Like the banter you get on the court, like that's what really helps. And I think like – the support groups on Facebook and everything, yeah, they're great. They have their purpose, but you need that one-on-one connection with people. You actually right. need to get out there and see that you're not alone because I think it is. It's a very lonely journey, and unless you're really able to find these people and network with them, then you don't really know what's out there. Oh, absolutely. 
what what is society's take in Australia when they see an amputee? You know, here in the States, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, I've seen an amputee before, no big deal. Other people stare, you know, especially kids and stuff that don't understand. But and some people are just downright rude. What's society? How do they how does society treat amputees in Australia? Basically like we're aliens. Okay. Um everyone knows an amputee, so like they always try and ask you if you know this person because they've got one arm or one leg. Um, and you're like, oh, no, sorry, I don't know every amputee. I know a lot of them, but um, you see the kids. The kids are always going to ask the questions, always going to point out and go, look, mum, that kid's, guy's got one leg. And then you see the look of horror in the mum's face. And but they try and protect, I don't know if they're protecting the kids from that or they're protecting the amputee from that, but they try and like huddle them away from you. I'm like, like no, let the kid ask what they want to ask. Right. Because at the end of the day, they grow up then learning that this does happen. And that this is a normal thing. It doesn't make you any less human because you've lost a limb. Um, but then in the city, you always get the people that stare at you and like just try and avoid you, like because they're freaked out. One of the things that you know your your case was when you first became an amputee was especially difficult, you know, because of all the multiple injuries that you had sustained. Once you're once you're conscious and have an understanding of what's going on, what. How do you decide that you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from this and I'm gonna get better and life's gonna go on? How do you get to that point? You need to hit rock bottom. Okay. And for me, what happened is that I came to and uh, basically they told me what had happened. That was an accident. I lost my leg. I couldn't sit up because of my neck. All I knew was in a hell of a lot of pain, and all I could manage was oh shoot. Um, and then I passed out with the pain. Um, over the next few days, like. I was absolutely raw. I was on water restrictions and we had 40 degree days. So I was really struggling with the heat. Uh, I had visitors from like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And mainly it was like all the sailors like from the ship coming in, uh, seeing how I was. I reckon all the boys just came to see the nurses in the ER personally. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they would all come in and have a chat. And then it was at night when everyone was gone and I was alone with my thoughts. Um, I started getting really suicidal and they ended up actually strapping me to the bed for three days straight because I was trying to rip all my breathing tubes out. And oh, wow. And uh, like, they actually got my mom to come in and stay with me overnight. They put a cot next to my bed and every night I would scream at her and beg for her to put a bullet in my head because I didn't want to be alive. I didn't want to be this one-legged freak and really a burden on society because you don't know what you're capable of. And that's right. why I make everything like public on social media now is so that like I can use my journey as an example of what you can do when you remove those limitations. And it was Paul de Gowda, the Navy clearance diver that lost his arm and leg in the shark attack in Sydney. Okay. And my captain like knew Paul. So he got him to give me a call and Paul pretty much told me, he's like, your doctors are going to tell you what you can and can't do for the rest of your life. He's like, the Navy's going to tell you, everyone is going to tell you what you shouldn't, shouldn't do based on what they believe is possible. He's like, tell them all to, f you know, your own limits. Like, you define your own limits, your limits don't define you. And that's now actually tattooed across my ribs. Oh, wow. And for me, that's when I started realizing that. Like, and then I read Paul's book as well, No Time to Feel. And that's when I started realizing that I can do this. Like, and I wanted to be alive. So it was all the painkillers that were making me feel numb. I'd, like, I'd lost the fight that I have now. Mm. So I got them to take me off all the strong medication, all the ketamine and all that morphine, all that stuff. And yeah, as soon as I was off that, I started responding. I started fighting. And I think that's the problem is that like we get taught to be afraid of pain. Every time we're in pain, like we get more painkillers thrown down your throat. And like pain lets you know you're alive. Right. Absolutely. So for me, like after my second amputation, like whatever they gave me, like that day while I was in surgery, um, after that, I didn't take a single painkiller. Wow. Uh, it took. It did take me a long time to get off it all. It was like ten months. I was addicted to it, so I was very conscious the second time around. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's real easy to uh, to get addicted to the pain medicine. When I first became an amputee, they just kind of fed it to me nonstop. And um, once I got off that, and then I had my revision done, and uh, I was just like, you know what? No, I'll let you know if I think I need anything, but let's just not. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that's the thing. Everyone tells you it's acceptable. Oh, you've got one leg. You have to take drugs. Right. And like, why? Why do we need it? I mean, I found as soon as I got off it, I didn't need it. It was my body telling me that I wanted it. Right. Absolutely. So how, when did you get to the point that I, I know that you do motivational speaking? When did you get the point that you knew that was something you wanted to do and to be able to go out and share your story and your experiences? 
Um, to start with, it was just like a few videos of my journey and stuff on Facebook. Um, and then I started training at Good Life, the gym that I'm sponsored by. And um, they're actually huge in Australia. And they actually offered, they were like, look, we do a monthly seminar where all the clubs come together and we like, normally pay someone to be able to like come and share the journey. And we actually want one of our members. And then like the gym manager suggested me. So like, would you be interested in coming to like speak to everyone? And now I'm the kid that couldn't get up and grade 10 English class and even put like a few words together and read a bit of Shakespeare. So I had no idea what I'm doing. I'm a mechanic and I'm about to do a motivation speech. Um, so I Googled everything, tried to find everything, but then whatever I found didn't work like it, cause it wasn't from me. So then I sat there and I wrote everything down that I wanted to say. And I showed the video that I've got on my Facebook and like, I just kind of read off the table. I had no idea what I was doing. I was shaking. I was sweating like crazy. Um, and I kind of just winged it. And then as I looked around, I saw everyone's reaction and I saw people in tears. Like there were people that wincing, like as I described my injuries and each one of the people, I think it was like 50 people in the room came up and actually spoke to me afterwards and said how much like it had changed their outlook. And then I thought, if I've got this ability to be able to like change people's outlook on life, then I should use it. So then from there, I actually started like learning how to speak and learning like the best ways with PowerPoints and dot points. And I found the better I got, the more opportunities I got. And it kind of just developed from there. Okay. Who or what inspires you? I think because of the high level I'm at, I find it hard to find inspiration. Okay. But for me, it's people like myself. Okay. It's like I was running a Spartan race uh, a couple of weekends ago, and there's a, um, an obstacle called Everest, and you actually go up and over the top, and like, it's on a 45-degree angle, and this thing looks impossible. And there was an amputee there with one arm, and he got up it when every able-bodied person was falling down. And it's people like him. I mean, I think for me, like, it's got to be really people that have overcome the worst. Um, I'm reading a book at the moment, which just really touched me. Uh, and that's Unmasked by Toria Pitt, uh, the Burns victim of the Australian bushfire. And uh, it's people like that that overcome the hardship and really don't let it affect them. That's what really works for me. Okay. How, how do you keep yourself motivated day to day? I don't need to. I've got other people to do that for me. Okay. They tell me I can't, and there's no better motivation than someone telling you you can't do something. What are some of the goals that you've set for yourself, some of the things that you would like to accomplish? Uh, I want to be able to co- uh, track the Kokoda Trail. Okay. Uh, the, Invict- the Invictus Games next year. Uh, I'm looking at those. Paralympics in 2020. Um, short term, I'm looking at running my first triathlon in December. Oh, nice. And then I've got a 12-hour endurance obstacle course race uh, next month. 12 hours. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so uh, we'll see how we go for that. Sure. And then uh, for work, I'm trying to change over to be a PT within the Navy. So, Oh, nice. That's a goal for me. Very cool. What, what kind of advice or encouragement would you give other amputees? You know, I um, – I work with people every day, amputees every day, you know, and they're struggling either physically or mentally, emotionally. And some people have given up. Some are just kind of trying to find their way. What kind of advice or encouragement would you give other amputees? I think what everyone's problem is, is that everyone, even able-bodied people, they compare themselves to top-level athletes or supermodels Mm -hmm. all the time. And that's what they expected to be. I mean, everyone's got to start somewhere. I started with my weight training, doing like a 10 kilo weight or like, being able to like squat a broomstick pole and you've got to start somewhere and you, you're fighting your own journey. There's no harm in getting motivation from other people's journeys, but at the end of the day, it only affects you. It only comes down to you. Um, you know, your own limitations. People are going to tell you what you shouldn't, shouldn't do. But if you know that you can do something or you believe that you've got the ability to, then don't let anyone take that from you. So today I've been yeah. talking with Mark Daniels and for more information about Mark, you can connect with him on Facebook and Instagram at Mark Daniels Motivation. Uh, Mark, thanks for taking time out of your day to join me on Revamp. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Brian. You've been listening to Revamped, the number one amputee podcast hosted by an amputee and brought to you by De La Torre Orthotics and Prosthetics in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you've enjoyed today's episode, leave us a review on iTunes or give us a like on Facebook. I'm Brian Mosier. 
I invite you to visit our website, www.revampedpodcast.com, and connect with us on Facebook at Revamped Podcast. 